Hi, everybody. In today's episode of Trek in Time, we're going to talk about what a Star Trek Doctor Who crossover might look like. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Welcome to Trek in Time, where we're watching every episode of Star Trek in chronological order. That means that right now we're still talking about Enterprise, which in the Star Trek universe are the oldest stories. As we do that, we're also taking a look at what our world was like at the time of the original broadcast, which means that we're currently talking about early 2003. And who are we? Well, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a published author. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And with me is my brother, Matt. Matt is the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. So between the sci-fi and the tech talk, we've got Trek covered, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing okay. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about, well, what would a Doctor Who Star Trek crossover look like? It's the episode Future Tense. And this episode is episode 16 of season two. And Matt, before we get into this, I understand you've got some comments you wanted to share from previous episodes. Yes, I do. There's one from Giant Hogweed Lives. From the episode Dawn, which is the episode where Trip is stranded on the planet with that alien and the two of them fight it out like enemy mine. Boy Scout tip for Trip. Set up camp on the shady side of a mountain so that you don't get sunburn. Yeah. Or was that just <laughs> lazy directing? Anyway, it distracted me. Yes, I also thought of Darmok while watching. Sean, I'm impressed that you remembered some of the lines from that episode. <laughs> when, he brought that up, when he brought up the thing about the sun, on the, I was like, that was in the back of my mind, but it never like, it never clicked of like, yeah, well, duh, all they had to do was kind of like go around to the other yeah. side and it would yeah. have been fine. <laughs> yeah, the the alien that Trip is hanging out with is the only one who has any shade and the shade that he's behind is created by a tiny little bush, I believe, yeah, and a part shrub. of a rock. And so he is hiding in the only shade available. Well, of course, 15 feet the other direction is the other side of that mountain and they would be fine. But yeah, that's neither here nor there. Yeah, the, the other comment I want to bring up, and this one is going to lead into when we talk about the current episode from RoboTrav, who comments all the time. Thank you very ro for that, RoboTrav. We need a podcast of just Matt struggling to read Wikipedia plot synopses while Sean tries to keep a straight face. Pure yes. gold. <laughs> yes. I think that that would, I mean, we could arguably just shorten these podcasts to just that and probably get <laughs> just as many people tuning in because, well, these Wikipedia entries are quite a wild ride <laughs> speaking of which guess what yes. time it is matt that it's bell you hear what is that oh it sounds like a read <laughs> alert and that read alert is letting us know that it's time for matt to read the wikipedia synopses matt take it here we go <laughs> always reading these cold i've never read these beforehand so here we go okay future tense is the 42nd episode production number 216 of the television series star trek enterprise it's the 16th of the second season <laughs> set in the 22nd century of the star trek universe a spaceship and its crew deal with aliens <laughs> as they explore space whoever's writing this has to stop the nx01 enterprise finds a derelict ship apparently from the future and is attacked by Suliban and later tholian ships seeking its position <laughs> okay that final sentence is all that had to be that's that was it yeah what's up with the first paragraph <laughs> the first paragraph i like that it ends with basically a yada 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 yeah and they explore space yeah, yeah, yeah. they 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 deal with these aliens as they explore space yeah so as that synopsis so not clearly and not concisely but as no. it points out, this episode revolves around the Enterprise crew discovering a derelict ship right out of the gate. The episode opens with a shot of the derelict ship that they are examining, and it is damaged beyond their ability to even recognize which end is which. They pull this thing aboard and they begin to examine it. So that's where this episode will start off. But where did this episode first land? Well, this episode first aired on February 19th, 2003. It was written by Mike Sussman and Phyllis Strong. We've seen their work before, and it was directed by James Whitmore. We've also seen his work before. What was the world like when this episode aired? On February 19th, 2003, Matt, you were still grooving out to I'm With You by <laughs> Avril Lavigne. 
And yeah. in a flashback to a moment that I actually remember. Yeah, I remember this one too. The movie, well, the movie of the week was Daredevil, starring Ben Affleck and Jennifer Gardner. And it opened with $40 million this week. And strange, I remember not only that this movie came out then, I remember when we saw this movie because you and I saw it together with our uncle and his kids, our cousins. So That's right, we did. (laughs) Shout out to Uncle Harry, Charlie, and Tim. And on TV, well... This episode earned 4.6 million viewers. How was that in the big picture? Well, for the show, it was about on par with the previous week. But when you compare it to some of the other programming that was available, like The Bachelorette, which got 20 million viewers, just our search. And again, (laughs) just like last week. Scratching my head, when was Star Search on CBS and Primetime? I don't recall that, but yeah, 10 million people do because they tuned in. That 70s show got 12 million. Ed, almost 9 million. So who did Enterprise beat in this time slot if it lost so handily to all those other shows? Well, Star Trek Enterprise beat the crap out of Birds of Prey yet again. Yep. As the WB shifted around its programming, trying to figure out how to be a network, Birds of Prey <laughs> had barely 3 million. So And never succeeding at that. <laughs> and never really succeeding. But for the week, what was the number one program? Well, Matt, I don't know about you, but I kind of had to take a deep breath when I saw that the number one program for the week was the show Joe Millionaire on Fox. I don't remember that at all. Which earned 40 million viewers what show what was that about i don't even remember joe millionaire (laughs) was a show on fox which was a reality competition in the same vein as the bachelor okay however the setup was all the women on the show were told that the bachelor in question was a millionaire okay which was in fact a lie it was in reality he was i believe carpenter or a construction worker something like that and at the end of the program when the final lucky lady was the sole winner of the show she was told about mr joe's actual occupation and income level to put her on the spot with would she actually stay with him nothing better than nothing better than emotional entertainment (laughs) manipulation (laughs) and uh, yeah i when I saw, the, I remembered the program. As soon as I saw the name, I was like, yeah, I remember Joe Millionaire. But to find out that it had 40 million viewers. It's shocking. Shocking. Absolutely dumbfounding. And in the news from the New York Times were articles around the economy, arguing that the economy is bad, but in New York, it's particularly horrid. Chirac, the leader of France, his scolding, of the U.S. and its allies leading toward the war in Iraq angered U.S. allies. And in the U.S., anti-war protests don't sway President Bush. At this point in mid-February, we were merely weeks away from the beginning of our operations to unseat Saddam Hussein and invade Iraq. So on to the episode. At this point, the last known date of an episode was September 2152. There are seven episodes with no date given until an episode that is dated January 2153. So as I've done in previous episodes, I arbitrarily decide to split the time up in whatever way makes sense with seven episodes, which means that this episode arguably takes place in early November of 2152. And as I mentioned before, we start off with the examination of a derelict pod in space, which is small enough for them to actually bring aboard into their shuttle bay. And it's a little bit longer than a shuttlecraft and doesn't even seem quite as big around as a shuttlecraft. It looks very much like some kind of satellite or escape pod or something like that. There's a lot of discussion about what they're looking at. They don't know which end is the front, which end is the back, but they do identify, Reed identifies what looks like could be a 
hatch and using a phaser, which is strangely and conveniently located in a panel on the wall. That kind of made me scratch my head. They've, we've had previous episodes in which there's been discussion around the armory. Yes. The importance of the security has been something that Reed has been banging on week by week for, for many episodes. But when it comes to he needs a phaser, there happens to be just a cabinet that he walks over to, opens with no difficulty, pulls out a phaser, which is just one of many. Yeah. And then he phasers the side of the <laughs> derelict craft. After he phasers it, the captain grabs what looks like some futuristic tool yes. that he wedges into the opening and it's supposed to look like it's magnetically attached. Yeah, I love when that. It's clear, I love when it. it's clearly, yeah. it's just Scott Bakula holding it in place badly as he's opening yeah. it up. And it was like, yeah. you could have just gotten a pry bar. You just could have yeah. gotten a pry bar out and, yeah. you know, it's, you know, it's, it's mechanics. This is not that yeah. hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> nitpick, you needed a, lever. a minor nitpick. You needed a lever, not a eye magnet of some sort. Yeah. Not everything has to be sci-fi. Yeah. So I, I love that too. I was like, hats off to you, Mr. Bakula, as you try to make it look like this thing is somehow sealed to the doorway while clearly it's going wobble, wobble, wobble. <laughs> and they open up the hatch and the captain climbs inside and discovers a body. And the body looks, strangely enough, human. So now begun, begins the mystery of deciphering not only what this device is, what this probe is, but who this person could possibly be. And the interior of the ship, one of the things that stood out to me as really working in this episode was it was not a case of them interpreting and deciphering every detail. No. It was a lot of loose threads because some of those threads weren't critical to the plot moving forward. I appreciate that kind of storytelling when some of the mystery is left mysterious and the things that happen aren't necessarily what we would anticipate. This episode starts with the sense that, oh, they found a thing. The people who made and use this thing will be what we will be looking at. And that is not the case. This thing, in this case, is a MacGuffin. It is a device to get the plot moving. Yep. So what we are left with is they find a body. The interior of this vessel is completely burnt out in a way that speaks of some tragic accident is how I interpreted it. It did not, at any point, they didn't say, oh, it looks like there's damage from weapons or There's nothing about the exterior of this vessel that clues you in as to what caused this. It's the interior that looks like some fire rushed through this thing, destroying every bit of the interior. So they can't even identify panels or circuitry. And the body is burned in such a way. And it was a tragic detail that I noted that the body actually looked like the hands were curled toward the chest. Yep. And it's a gruesome little detail that I happen to know, which is that when a person is in a fire, the heat's effect on the muscles causes that kind of curling inward. So that little nuance, that little bit of detail really struck a chord with me as I was, mm-hmm. as I was watching the episode. The examination of the body that takes place with flocks. <clears throat> follows but i felt like this experience at the beginning starts off with the real kind of excited mystery but as soon as they find that body it felt like it took on a reverence in a very subtle way what did you think about the whole introduction of the mystery of what this thing is i liked the mystery box they were building like especially when they start to investigate the ship they're like we can't find propulsion we can't we how does this even work i can't even find a power source it's like the mystery of this is so beyond our understanding, I really enjoyed. And I liked the mystery around it. And I understood it, it, it was clear that it was all a MacGuffin, that we're not going to get the answers to all this stuff. We're not going to get the complete answers as to why this person died. Mm-hmm. It, it was clear that this was just a, a starting off point. So for me, I liked it. We can get into this more as we go through the episode. But at the end of the episode, what they ended up delivering to me from the setup 
was kind of disappointing in the end because mm-hmm. there's very little agency in anything that happens in this episode. Mm-hmm. It's literally the Enterprise going from step to step to step, just like flailing, like, oh, not knowing what's going on and not being able to really take control of the situation or have agency about what's going on. And by the end, the, there's only one thing that happens that they have some like little pin that they put in that helps the the resolution but at the end of the episode there wasn't much to take away from it wasn't like you we i walked away from the episode going oh okay so this is this is all about developing this character or this was all about setting up a plot for the future thing over here at the end it was kind of like why did i watch this like what was it what am i supposed to take away from this 42 minutes of this show that i just watched and i couldn't put my finger on it yeah. So even though I enjoyed the ride at the end, it was like, it was like eating popcorn. It was like, you know, it's like, yeah, I ate all this stuff and I'm still hungry. And it's like, it's like what, what did you just give me? Yeah. It feels like there are episodes that we've talked about already that fall into multiple camps. One of the camps is well done for what it is. Yeah. Well done and pushes boundaries of storytelling yeah. in Star Trek. Not so well done. and not so well done, but still trying to push boundaries. Mm-hmm. And this one felt like well done, but it didn't feel like it was pushing any boundaries. No, nope. but it would have, if it had been a first season episode, if they'd this already, had they'd already followed, dealt with a lot of this stuff yeah. in previous episodes. So it was this, nothing new. If this had been the introduction of some of the time cold war, the temporal cold war, right after they introduced the character of Daniels. And we'll talk yes. more about Daniels a little bit in this discussion. If this episode had followed closely on the introduction of Daniels, I feel like it would have had its place. The Sulaban take center stage as the threat in this episode. At this point, the Sulaban are easily dismissed as a thing within the storytelling of yep. Enterprise. The yep. second season has has largely just forgotten them. In fact, we've had episodes in which we've seen that not all Sulaban are in fact a threat. So the introduction of them showing up and immediately the response is red alert, these people are a problem. I thought this feels old. This feels dated. Yep. So we end up with a situation, like you said, they don't have agency. They're reactive to everything. There's no taking a hold of something. And if you're going to have that kind of story, you better focus in on one particular character growing as a result of this. And I feel like yep. this episode was about three clicks away from that character being to Paul. If really? they had just dialed it up a little bit more, this was another case of to Paul wrestling with is time travel a thing that's real. That's interesting. Cause that's not the person I would have dialed the, the dials up on. I would have said trip. That's where both you and I are pointing out in those different decisions Mm -hmm. about where the episode doesn't really make a point. Yeah. Because we're debating about who could have been the main character of this. Well, for for me, that was trip because he's the when I talked about putting the pin, like the only thing that happens where the crew actually has an inkling of agency is when trip finally gets that little remote device that they find aboard the ship. He gets it working. Right. And once he gets it working, it's basically a beacon to the future so that they right. can come back and get all their stuff that they, they, that was broken and left behind. Right. So it's, that's the only thing that happens in the entire episode. That's like, they did something to prevent the bad guys from getting their hands on this. But at the same time, it was like, it was such like a, here's a little five second thing. And there was nothing built around it, which is why I was like, if they had this dialed up trip, because it, when they're investigating the ship in the beginning, and they go inside and they find that like the um, organic circuitry, which to me was like a, a nod to Voyager because Voyager had organic stuff yeah. in it. When they pull that thing out and they find the hatch, which is basically turning this little ship into the TARDIS where it's bigger on the inside than it is on yeah. the outside. I did not care that it was ripping off Doctor Who. I thought that was yeah. fun. I thought that was yeah. really fun. Just this, this shaft just going deep down. They're like, where the hell does this go? Yeah. That was, that was amazing. So it's clearly super future tech that they came and wrap their heads around and they find all the stuff. It's like in, in a trip is immediately like I'm going down and Reed's like, we should be telling the captain. He's like, no, I'm going, which I thought was such a great nod to what, whatever the Bible is they have for the show trip is 
an explorer, an adventurer. Yeah. He wants to find new things. And so it's like, nothing's going to hold him back from going down that ladder because that's why he's out here to do right. this. And so for me, it was like, okay, this episode's going to be about trip because here's trip being trip going down the like, yeah. down the ladder and he's going to go do trip things and he's going to have some kind of character development and it doesn't go anywhere because it's just him basically tinkering with this thing the entire episode and then he gets it working and then it goes away right. where they could have dialed that up a couple notches and they could have had an entire storyline around him maybe pushing the captain saying no i think this is the key i think this is the key that we can use to try to stop this situation instead the captain's like let's go put a bomb on the ship so that right. you know if somebody <laughs> takes it we can blow it up it's right. like it would have been better if trip was like i've got the answer you have to trust me it would have been great right. to have more of a dynamic there right it's it's similar to what you're saying with with T'Pol. it's like yeah. you could have easily gone the way with T'Pol too so i see what you're talking about so before we get any deeper into the territory that Matt and I usually end up in, which is we put rewriting our writer's hats on <laughs> and we start rewriting the episode just to kind of like super consolidate the rest of it. Because I don't think this is an episode that requires the kind of point by point, blow by blow synopsis. They find this vessel, as Matt pointed out, they open up a chamber. They find two things. They find that there is organic circuitry inside. They find that when they open up the panel, it has a shaft that goes down into what is probably an engineering compartment, which is so far down that when Trip tests it by dropping a tool, it has a good three or four second count before you hear the thing hit the ground, which means you're looking at a, a shaft that's probably 100 feet deep. Meanwhile, Flox is looking at the body in sickbay and discovers that first there's human DNA as the majority of it. But then he begins to recognize there's something strange about the DNA and he puts a little research into it and discovers that the individual's great grandparent was probably a Vulcan, which makes everybody, the captain to Paul, everybody scratch their heads because at this point, this is still early days of everybody trying to get along. There apparently at this point have been no cross species commingling of DNA, but it doesn't stop there. Flox discovers a number of other including Tellarite and some alien DNA that he can't even identify. And so this is a individual from a far future in which this kind of commingling is clearly not foreign and it makes everybody kind of reel back on their heels. It's at this point that T'Pol is pushing back against facts. And this is where I began to see, as opposed to Matt's argument that Trip should be the focus, this is where I began to think that, oh, T'Pol is going to be the focus of this episode because I thought it was going to be her repeating steadfastly the arguments of time travel is not possible. And it was going to reach the point of her arguing against facts in front of her to the point where she would have to either bend or break under her own logical arguments and that it would create a moment for her of recognizing we have been experiencing how the Vulcan high command isn't always truthful mm -hmm. and seeing that not only is there a hesitance for complete honesty, but also having to recognize the limits of Vulcan knowledge. I thought mm -hmm. it was going to lead to a moment where she would, where she would be saying to the captain, I've just now recognized that while we stand ahead of you, there are those that stand ahead of us. And the limits of my knowledge are not the limits of reality. One of the things as you were talking that occurred to me, and here comes the rewriter, we both could be right yep. in it could have been Tripp and T'Pol working together on what is this device and Tripp making the argument based on faith and assumption, I think what we're looking at is a beacon. And I think if we turn this on, I think it will send a signal. And I think if it sends a signal, we'll be sending it to the future. And she could be making the argument of, we have no idea what that device is. Spending any time on it is a waste of our time. We should be doing other things, trying to figure out what to do with this yep. device. And the two of them as the tension is ratcheted up and where does the tension come from well i actually enjoyed the tension of the not the first alien race they introduced the suliban yes. fine the suliban are there i really love the fact that we see the tholians 
hundred percent. The Tholians were introduced in the original series in the third season in the episode, the Tholian web. One of my favorite, if most unused of the alien species, they are described as being non-humanoid. They are believed to be crystalline in nature. And I love the fact that when they are communicated with, they come through as large high pitched squeaks that the computer yes. is able to decipher, but it's a little bit like listening to an incredibly aggressive dolphin. I took it as that was their translation, not our translation. Right. And whatever it was, I thought the, the rendering of how they communicated was brilliant. It was yeah. so cool because it was so alien, so bizarre and the squeaks and the squeaks wheels and all the crazy sounds and then also the actual like things that were being translated into english yeah were just so great that it came, the the emotion of these tholians came through and the foreignness of them came through it was so much fun it was i wish they had done more with it and one of the things that stood out for me was everything you just described latched onto the depiction of the tholians from the original series it was like they did a masterful job of in 2003 pulling that late 60s, early 70s vibe out yeah. in the way that this alien spoke. Yeah. So the Tholians arrive and there's very early speculation. Well, we were told in the Temporal Cold War there are different factions. It's possible the Tholians are working for a different faction. And that, in fact, turns out to be the case. When the Suliban and the Tholians first cross paths, they almost, without hesitation, they start firing on each other. A firefight <laughs> breaks out between the two of them. And yeah. the Enterprise has been trying to get to a Vulcan ship because the Vulcan ship being faster will be able to get this derelict ship back to Earth faster. But when they arrive, they find that the Vulcan ship has been immobilized. They keep repeating, the Vulcans don't seem to have lost any lives, but the ship is dead. So there's a dead Vulcan warship. The Enterprise has been knocked out of commission. and the Suliban and the Tholians are chasing each other around in circles, destroying each other with the Tholians having the edge. And I like the fact that the Tholians have the ability to, it, it demonstrates a danger from the Tholians that they hadn't explored up to this Tholians point. Are, the Tholians are badasses. They come They in are very wreck. quick. They are very quick to be able to, to outmatch the Suliban. So the Tholians then have the ability to grab a hold of the derelict ship rip it out of the enterprise and they're just carting it away while meanwhile the enterprise archer has been trying to plant a photon torpedo warhead into this vessel here's one of the things about this episode revolving around time yeah that i didn't think worked as well and it was the time loops what did you think about really? the time loops yeah i put a note saying i loved it and part mm -hmm. of the reason i loved it was the reason I, the whole episode felt empty was nobody had agency. There was nothing. There was no growth of characters. There was nothing that progressed the real plot of the show along. It was kind of a nothing episode by the end. Mm -hmm. But I thought what they did to ratchet tension each step of the way was wonderful. So it's like the whole oh here's the Suliban. Oh no, now here's the Tholians. And oh my god, the Tholians are kicking the asses of the Suliban. And it was yeah. just like this ratcheting up and the. The, them racing trying to get to the Vulcans it's like okay there's, so there's just tension on top of tension on top of tension and they get there and the, the Vulcans are knocked out of commission and it's like oh my god what are they gonna do I thought that the time loops were very effective because every time they looped as they were trying to do the warhead it was one of those they almost got oh they almost got it and it was just like this it just kind of ratcheted that Oh God, this isn't going to work. Like how, how is this possibly going to work? So for me, it, I liked it because it was making that, it was making that tension going from seven to nine to 10 to 11, 12, like they were going way beyond and really ratcheting that, that sense of urgency up. But again, at the end, it didn't matter because none of this mattered. It was like, right. <laughs> it's like, okay, this is the problem when you deal with uh, time travel. It's like at the end of the day. It's like nothing ever happened. So why did we tell the story in the first place? Right. For me, I, I felt like the time loop issue was another example of we've seen this before. Yes. So I felt like it was a little bit of a distraction and a little bit of filler. I would have appreciated something happening with time 
that might have been a little unique to the moment. Like they have this vessel aboard the Enterprise and they identify that it's emitting a radiation which is affecting time. They first discover this because of a time loop issue where Reed and Trip experience the time loop in the the bay as they're working on the vessel. And here's where it becomes a little samey. We've seen episodes that have revolved around the ship caught in a time loop before. We've seen on Next Generation, we've seen the episode where they get caught in an accident where they have a collision with another vessel coming through a warp, through a through a wormhole. And it causes a looping sequence where they just go through the same problem again and again. We see another episode of Next Generation where a alien race has effectively wiped the minds of everybody and has put into motion a an experience for the crew where they will no longer want to go to a certain place, but the crew can't help but be curious. This was first too easily identified by the crew as happening. And ultimately, it didn't feel like to me it mattered. And it would have felt to me like it could have been a little more unique in its depiction. I think if you had the kind of limited area where time is affected, it would have been interesting if what was happening in the shuttle area was time was simply static. It was maybe moving slower than anticipated. So people who would go into the shuttle bay area. Yep. would come out and for them it, they had been working for hours but when they came out only a few minutes had passed something that would have been okay when we're in there there's something different going on because as you mentioned the tension at the end didn't really matter so building up the tension the way you described it which i agree Correct. was an yes. interesting practice it was a little bit like they had a fire drill going they did it the first time, they stumbled through it. They did it the second time, they were a little bit faster. By the time they get it to actually be aboard, the, they get the warhead aboard the, the craft, they're super efficient at this point. They're actually able to beat whatever the sequence of the loop is. So they're able to get it aboard, and then immediately, it doesn't matter. Because the, th- well, the, th- the Tholians deactivated. It was like, this, okay. The Tholians deactivated. Womp, womp. And for me, it was like, okay, you, what if it was something else? What if it was just like, well, something that would be a little more creative and a little more engaging for the viewer. And then you could still have them put the bomb aboard the thing, but not waste energy with that in the way that it felt like they did. It felt like they were so well, focused on that moment that it didn't work for me. I love that we rewrite all these episodes. What we just talked about before was how I was arguing that the story could have been about Trip, and you said it could have been about Trip and to Paul and the two of them arguing. It could have been if they had leaned into that that the captain wanted to put the warhead on the ship as a plan B if Tripp's right. idea fails. And so you could have Reed and the captain struggling to get this warhead on. And ultimately, they don't succeed even getting it on because this loop is just preventing them from doing it. Mm-hmm. And then it's all on trip. So they could have used it in that way where, yeah. yeah, okay, we've seen it before. It's not a unique way of doing the time travel loop thing. But if they use it as a device, to put all of the pressure on Trip's shoulders because the plan yeah. B is not working. There is no plan B. It's all plan A. And if they had done that, it would have made Trip's work that much more um, uh, purposeful. Yeah. And so when he got it working, it would have been the, yes, he got it working. Instead, all of it felt like, eh, eh, eh. Everything that was happening was just kind of like, meh, kind of a shoulder shrug to everything. Even when he activates it, it's kind of like, Meh. <laughs> like, yeah. nobody's celebrating that he got it done it's just like okay <laughs> yeah what's the point so ultimately there's this chase in space the tholians the suliban are fighting each other the warhead is placed above the aboard the vessel the tholians still manage to steal the ship and then deactivate the explosive without any difficulty so this what saves the day well it's ensign daniel's magic hat that's right Here's where the episode for me, like, very disappointing. When they go, and they've done this now in a number of episodes, they remember suddenly, oh yeah, we've got this Wikipedia from the future, and it's in Ensign Daniels' cabin. At this point, I cannot believe that 
the captain wouldn't have relocated this database to a more secure location. Mm -hmm. I can't believe that the captain would still have access to the database. Like, Mm -hmm. has he not mentioned to Starfleet that he has this thing? Mm -hmm. And when they remember is very selective Mm -hmm. in a way that just when they, makes when they were going, my, makes yes. my writer head hurt. It when is, they were going to the room, I just wanted to go, just stop. Just yeah. stop. Yeah. You didn't, you, they didn't even need it. They didn't even need that scene. Yeah. And it would have been fine. And ultimately, the introduction of this database that Daniels has left behind is a big problem for mm-hmm. the show. It mm-hmm. doesn't make sense from a writer's standpoint to write into the program that the captain and the crew have access to future knowledge basically whenever they want and to introduce it in one episode. And then at the end of that first episode, have that database become corrupted, have it be reclaimed, have it be stolen, have something happen to it, take it out of their reach. But the way that it exists on the show in this episode, it stands out as being a big problem. For it's a crutch. The storytelling. Yes. Yeah. It's crutch. It is, it is a Deus Machina. It just comes out of nowhere. Here comes a hand from God who just tweaks the show in this way that, like, oh, by the way, we can go figure out what's going on just by going over here. And they go in and examine blueprints effectively for the ship that they have found so that they can identify that this is in fact a craft from the future. This is another moment where to Paul's entire argument just falls apart and they don't examine that at all. It's, it's a failing in the episode. And I say that despite the fact that at the end of the episode, I had fun watching the episode. It's, it a, is, it's a fun ride. It's a fun episode. What saved it for me was all the Tholian experience, like the Tholian involvement. The the Suliban were sort of a B grade baddie in the episode for me. The Tholians were the the A game, and the fact that the two of them go toe to toe, that you have this whole experience devolve into Trip gets the device going, and within minutes, everything that they've been interacting with simply disappears. It's all just transported away. So what happened? They have for the people who are scratching their heads about the ending. They, I don't think they needed it. I think it was pretty clear, but at the end they do have a little synopsis for like Mm -hmm. this episode for dummies where Archer points out, well, the moment you activated that the people in the future had all the time in the world to identify the signal, locate when it was coming from where it was to come in and scoop everything up. So the moment it's activated, the Tholians lose hold of the thing they were trying to steal. The Suliban are no longer around, and even the Enterprise is left without anything in hand. I think a little bit of a tweak to the writing would have been if only the thing in Daniels' quarters was also taken away. It should have been. It should have been like, this was the last time we will ever be able to use this because by by activating this device, they now know where that database is. That should have also been taken. However, that doesn't happen. The, but on the whole, I enjoyed the episode. Yeah, there's, there's two scenes I would want to bring up as two scenes I thought were very charming, nice, a little bit of fan fiction-y. Yeah, okay, it's cool to see this. The first one is the late night snack scene between T'Pol and Phlox. And this goes back to a previous comment I've said before. Phlox is my favorite character in the show. Yeah. When Phlox is there, everything's better. I feel warm and fuzzy inside whenever he's on screen. It's just wonderful. I love how he is challenging to Paul's view on things. And I also loved when the conversation starts, he is genuinely giddy, like a kid on Christmas morning when he's talking Mm -hmm. about, I found even more alien DNA in this thing. And it's like, these genetics (laughs) are awesome. He is just so fascinated by the science behind this crazy corpse they found. Yeah, He just loves it. He's just eating it up. And I just love that aspect of it. And the second scene I, I, I was I really appreciated was the very end when the captain said, offers up the apology, please, I want to convey my apologies to the Vulcans yeah. for the situation because we kind of got them into this and to thank them for doing what they did. Yeah. I thought that was a nice touch because one of the purposes of this entire series is that this is the formation 
of the Federation. The Archer is supposed to be some great diplomat that pulls everything together. And in the beginning, he was a reluctant diplomat. He did not want to be doing any of this stuff and he was not good at it. Mm -hmm. And now we're, we're slowly seeing him get better about it and starting to open his mind to it. And then like, for me, this was like one of the first glimmers of he's really starting to lean into that role yeah. of understanding. I have to put out olive branches and I have to show appreciation because he's trying to build those relationships. And I thought that was a nice, literally like a 10 second scene. I thought, okay, that is a nice little glimmer of what we're going to be getting in the future, supposedly. Yeah. So it's like, I, I did like that. Yeah, and it and it goes both ways too. The fact that they find this thing and they are going to be able to rely on the Vulcans to help get it to Earth. Yep. Like that demonstrates like the Vulcans recognize like, oh, there's this thing. There's this mystery around this thing. And they're just as, probably just as curious when they've been informed potentially that a thing was found that had a human, but the human also had Vulcan DNA. The Vulcans are probably saying, like, this is a mystery we would like to help crack. Yep. So I think that it demonstrates it going both directions. I agree with you completely that that scene with, with Archer really resonates. And I also think that the thing that came out of the scene with Phlox, I love when Phlox and T'Pol interact because yes. humans are arguably in the middle between the two of them. They represent mm -hmm. the two extremes. And when they are together, Phlox invariably is, takes the role of almost a older brother teasing, mm -hmm. you know, gently teasing to Paul and he voices kind of a through line for his character in, I have learned to embrace surprise. And that's the part of this episode that if you and I were to rewrite it in the ways we've talked about, one of the things I would push to the forefront is having to Paul say she has to embrace surprise mm -hmm. in that way. Reality has presented things which she has been logically told cannot be, and it is tainting her ability to embrace reality. Mm -hmm. And it keeps that element of surprise from doing its job. Phlox is excited and energized by surprise. She shuts down. Yeah. And I think it would have been nice for the episode if we had had our rewriting gloves in the mix, the potential for her to have a moment of leaping with faith, especially if it was with trip mm -hmm. pulling her forward to say like this thing potentially could do this, but I can't figure out how to make it do that. And if she has a moment of perhaps this is the way to make that leap of faith. And she does this leap of faith, not believing it will work, but what if, Mm -hmm. And that, that potential of that moment was unfortunately lost, missed. It was lost. Yeah. Um, but on the whole, like I said, I, I enjoyed this episode and I think the episode holds up and I especially like the fact that it did incorporate, I have a feeling it's a bit of fan fiction on the writer's part that they incorporated this whole, it's bigger on the inside time mm -hmm. travel aspect. It has a very timey wimey aspect to it. and. Mm -hmm. I think as a whole, it was a fun episode. Yeah. Before we sign off, I reminded everybody, we'll be back next time with the episode Canamar. Man, any predictions as to what we'll be talking about when we talk about Canamar? It's not even a word. I so don't what even do you know think how to, I don't know how to respond to this. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of speculating about what Canamar is, why don't you tell us about what you got coming up on your other channel? I've got a couple of videos coming up about do solar panels on cars make sense? And mm -hmm. it's uh, it's interesting. I thought it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to give anything away, but it's it's no uh, spoilers. No, it's not but, what you think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As for me, you can check out my website seanfarrell.com, or you can look for my books at your favorite bookstore. You should be able to find them anywhere the books are sold. If you'd like to support this show, please do consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or right here on YouTube, wherever it is that you listen. And if you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show and click on Become a Supporter. All of that really does help the show. And thank you so much for listening, everybody. And we'll talk to you next time.